Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. This is James Oldfield coming to you. This is Sunday, November the 19th, and we hope that you are ready for a study from God's Word. We're going to be talking about grace this afternoon and what is involved in grace. Are we saved by grace only? Is there anything that man has to do to be involved in being saved by grace, as the Bible talks about? Is... Uh, is the church even connected to grace? We're going to listen to a preacher that says that that uh, in the book of Acts you have you don't have uh, grace mentioned in the uh, first part of the book of Acts, so we shouldn't talk about the church being uh, we shouldn't talk about the church being uh, involved in grace, or we or we shouldn't be patterning the church after. Uh, the church in the book of Acts since it doesn't have any, any grace in it. So uh, interesting things going on today on the program and so I hope that you are ready for a study from God's Word. But before we get started, we want to give you our phone numbers where you can reach us. If you want to be a part of the program, this is a live call-in program so you can call in with your Bible questions and comments and, and discussion and we'll be glad to to uh, um, talk to you about, about the Bible. Our phone numbers are area code 336 Four two seven nine six nine six. That's four two seven W M Y N, or six two seven nine five six three six two seven W L O E. And so, if you'd like to be a part of the program, that is what uh, what we're going to be discussing today. <clears throat> uh, just, I want you to know that this program is brought to you by the the Church of Christ that meets in uh, in Eden, North Carolina. We're at two fifty the Boulevard. If you'd like to come visit with us. You're welcome to do that. Uh, we meet Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, and Thursday nights, typically Thursday nights, at 7 p.m. And so we hope that you will um, come by and visit with us. Uh, this is Thanksgiving uh, week. The week uh, Thanksgiving falls on Thursday. We're moving our Bible study up to, to uh, Tuesday this week. Uh, people won't be out of town or visiting, so they won't be able to be there on Thursday night this week, but normally we do meet on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. for Bible study. We hope that you'll come out and visit with us at the church with the Church of Christ uh, there in Eden. And again, our phone number is 427-9696, 427-9696, or 627-9563, 627-9563. If you want to reach me uh, just on, on a personal uh, basis, or maybe you want to talk to me after the program is over, my phone number is 276 Three four zero two six five three two seven six three four zero two six five three, or you can reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail dot com. And so we hope that you will uh, take advantage of the opportunities you have to uh, to study with us. And uh, we're folks, you know, folks in the Church of Christ are are interested in studying the Bible. And I think you'll find that a lot of times when you start talking about the Bible, it doesn't take long before your religious neighbors, they, they want to get off the subject. They'd rather talk about the football game. They'd rather talk about the weather, anything but the Bible. But, friends, we're the people that want to talk about the Bible. This is this is the home of the $1,000 offer, uh, $1,000 reward. So if you if you have a Bible question and you want to uh, discuss it, we'll be glad to discuss it. Call in and ask us about the $1,000 reward. Friends, let's get on and get to, get, go on and get into our lesson uh, today. We're going to be talking, as I said, we're going to talk about grace and the reason why we need grace is because men, at some point in our lives, we, we become separated from God. Now, there are some individuals that will say you're born in sin. Uh, the Bible rejects that. That's, that's a false doctrine, according to the Bible. But the Bible does say that at some point we separate ourselves from God. When we sin, we, sep we are separated from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, if you'll listen to what the Bible has to say, Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 and I hope that you have your Bibles uh, with us with you and that you're taking notes but Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 the Bible says behold the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear now friends that's why when uh, when you go over to John chapter 9 and you read the blind man, the words of the blind man where he says, 
uh, we know that God heareth not a sinner's prayer. Well, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 is, is what he's alluding to. The idea that God will not hear sinners, those who are, are in uh, disobedience to him, they, your sins separate you from God. So if God will not hear because of your sins, how in the world is someone who is an alien sinner going to uh, call upon God and ask him for forgiveness? So, so in order to get back with God, in order to get back together, we need something that will, that will help remove that sin. <clears throat> well, what, what is that going to be? Well, let's read Ephesians 1 and verse 6. Ephesians 1 and verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So if sin separates us from God, now Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 1 that those folks in Ephesus who had obeyed the gospel, and you can read about their conversion in Acts chapter 19, but they now are, Paul says, are accepted in the beloved. Now, friends, this is where, this is why we always say let the Bible be its own best commentary. Uh, what does it mean accepted in the beloved? I mean, what is in the beloved? Well, you may recall in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, uh, the Bible says in verse 16, Matthew 3, 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So when Paul says then that God's grace hath made us accepted in the beloved, he says he's made us accepted in Christ. So God's grace is what helps us get in Christ or into Christ. It's the bridge. It, there's, there's something about grace that is, that is helping us overcome the sin that separates us and reconcile us to God. And that's exactly what we're talking about is God's grace. Titus 2 verse 11. Let's read this. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto, to all men. So it's God's grace that appears to men and it brings salvation. But now notice. It's not grace alone. It is grace that's bringing the salvation. It is grace that's making it possible. That's why Paul will later on say in Titus 3 and verse 7, being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, some people might read Titus 3 and verse 7 and say, well, there you go, James, justified by grace. Friends, you never see the word only. And I, I don't know why people read only into these verses. I, no one denies in, in the church of Christ, we don't deny that you're saved by grace or you're justified by grace. It's just when people say justified or saved by grace only that there you, you have a problem. So you've changed what the Bible says when you add only to it. And so um, if we're separated from God, then we need God's grace to get us back together. So what, what really is grace? Well, grace is unmerited favor or it's a gift. And, and so God's grace is that answer of of bringing men back together. Sin has separated us, so God's grace is what brings us, is going to help bring us back together. It's, uh, it's really his graciousness. You know, his graciousness is the reason why he's willing to forgive and not punish man for man's sins. Uh, you know, when you, uh, when you owe something, uh, when you have a debt and someone forgives that debt, that's their graciousness. They're being very gracious to you. They're giving you a gift. You know, they're giving you a reprieve or giving you uh, some leeway. And so that's really what we're talking about. Notice what the psalmist said. Now, friends, y you can learn a lot about God's uh, characteristics by reading through the Bible. And one of his characteristics of grace is, is clearly seen throughout the Bible. Uh, and oftentimes... The atheists or the agnostics or the skeptics, they, they want to say, well, God, the God of the Old Testament anyway is, is a cruel God. Uh, there was a local atheist here that I know you've probably heard us refer to many times, uh, oh, uh, uh, Larry Serber. And that's what he said, you know, he says, God of the Old Testament is a, is a cruel God. But listen to what the psalmist says. Now, this is the Old Testament, Psalm 86, verse 15. Psalm 86, 15. But thou, O Lord are they God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and in truth. So 
God is not a, a terrible God. He's not a cruel God. He's a gracious God. He's a merciful God, long-suffering God. And it all comes down to his, his grace. Remember what Jonah said? When Jonah was sent to, to Nineveh to preach, to tell those people to repent, he didn't want to go. And the reason he didn't want to go because he knew that God was a gracious God. As a matter of fact, that's what he says in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah chapter 1, uh, excuse me, chapter, chapter 4, Jonah chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, that is, when they repented, it, it displeased him. And he was very angry, and he prayed unto the Lord, and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. So, uh, again, you see God's grace, his, his mercy, his long-suffering being, being manifested toward man. And so when you think about God's grace and how it connects a uh, sinful man and brings him to salvation, then we have to understand there's, there's a process. Now, uh, in Ephesians 2 and verse 5, this is a verse that, that many people know when they talk about grace. This is one that everybody, everybody knows. Most people can quote it by heart, especially uh, verse 8. Uh, and they don't know, really know really all the verses before it or after it, but they definitely know verse 8. But listen to the context and listen to what Paul's saying. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 5. Paul says, Even when you were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now stop for a minute. Remember Paul, what Paul said in chapter 1, verse 6, Ephesians 1, 6? He said that we have been made accepted in the beloved. Well, he's talking to people who are already in Christ. And so he's reminding them how they got into Christ. He said, you're saved by grace. Now, he didn't say saved by grace only. He said, by grace are you saved. And he said he's made us, raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, in verse, in verse 7, In the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, that is the verse that, that most people know, most people can quote, and that's really probably about all they know about grace. But friends, I want you to notice something about grace. When we're studying the Bible, we need to take, uh, take note of everything that the Bible is saying about grace and look at it from all sides. Because there are two sides of salvation. There are two aspects of salvation. That's the human side and divine side. God's grace is what is making salvation available. The grace of God uh, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, as we read earlier in Titus 2 verse 11. But there's also faith. That's man's part. Grace is, is God reaching out. Faith is man reaching back to God. Now, these two verses, these verses point out two things, a positive and a negative aspect of, 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 of salvation. Here's what I mean. By grace through faith, that's positive. And then there's the negative, not by works. Now, the misunderstanding comes from not understanding these two parts or these two sides of Ephesians uh, 2 verse 8. They don't understand faith and grace. They don't understand faith and works. They don't understand how those two go together. They look at it and say, well, it's no works at all. No, that's not what it's saying. Listen, it says, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. Now, there's a certain kind of works that it's not of, but it doesn't mean no works at all. So let's understand grace <clears throat> from, from what is being said in Ephesians 2 verse 8. Let's look at this, this phrase again. By grace are you saved. Now, friends, again, there's no doubt that salvation comes by grace. No one is saying that you're not saved by grace. No one is saying that grace is not part of man's salvation. 
I mean, the Bible is clear that, that grace is definitely connected to salvation. Because notice, in Romans 3, verse 24, Paul says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So there's redemption by his grace. But notice, it's not grace only. It's never grace only. And again, 1 Timothy 1, verse 13. Paul says that he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. But none of these verses say grace only. Now, friends, if you, if you take what Paul said, and, and you say, well, Paul said he was saved by grace, okay? The grace of God is definitely what saved him. But when you look at what Paul did, in uh, on the on the road to Damascus, I mean, when you realize what Paul did before his sins were forgiven, I mean, there was a lot involved, and it wasn't just grace. If he was saved by grace, he would have been right there on the road to Damascus and saved, and he wouldn't have to go into Damascus and find Ananias, and he wouldn't be told, uh, you know, stop praying, why tarest thou, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. He wouldn't have been told that if it was saved by grace only. But he was saved by grace, true enough, but it wasn't by faith only. But now notice, if if you're in the in, in a denomination, notice what the Baptist manual teaches. Now listen carefully. This is from the Baptist manual. We believe the scriptures teach that the salvation of sinners is holy of grace. Holy of grace. Now friends, if it's holy of grace, that's W H O L L Y, not H O L Y but completely of grace. Well, if it's completely of grace, then uh, uh, then that leaves no room for anything else. All right, we've got a phone call. You're on the air. Turn your, turn your phone down. Turn your radio down. Hello, caller? Caller? Caller, can you hear me? Caller, can you hear me? Hello? Turn your, turn your radio down. Okay. How you doing, James? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing so good. I'll call and tell you all half the Thanksgiving. Well, thank you. We're talking about grace today. Well, I know that. I know. Well, well let's let's have a discussion on it. Well, I'll thank Thanksgiving the whole world for it and do. Do what now? Say, say have, that. Have a good day. All, all right. All right. All right. <clears throat> Wasn't really quite sure what that was, but that's good. I'm glad we're listening. All right. So, now, notice the very verse in question, that's Ephesians 2, verse 8, states that there is faith connected to the grace of God. So it can't be completely by grace. Are you with me, friends? It can't be completely or wholly by grace because the very verse that is used to say grace only is connected to grace. By grace are you saved through faith. So if salvation were by grace alone, then all would be saved. Everybody would be saved. That's, that's, that's what's called universalism. If God's grace brought salvation to all men, then you, you're going to be saved whether you like it or not. You know, it's, it's, it's like you're, you're going to have to you're going to have to be saved regardless of whether you want to be saved or not. Are you with me? So this is why we're, uh, uh, this is why we're um, saying it can't be holy by grace. All right, I'm, I'm getting text saying we can't hear anymore. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to do here. Okay. After phone call, all went quiet. So I don't know if that's on our end or maybe... Um, the listeners in but we're keep plugging along i got the light that says we're on the air so we're rolling all right so uh, titus 2 verse 11 for grace for the grace of god that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men now friends if again if it's just by grace if that's all you need then uh there's no need for faith no need for repentance no need for uh for anything okay so let's look at acts 2 verse 40 notice this uh, there's no way the doctrine of limited atonement. Now, there's 
there's a belief that says, well, there's only a certain number of people, chosen people, right, that, uh, that are going to be saved. Well, that can't be true if it's holy by grace. I mean, if, all you, if, if you're all saved by grace, then, uh, then what? There's no limited atonement. That means everybody's saved. So either everybody's saved or, or not. Is, is holy by grace true or is limited atonement true? See, and so you, you start seeing when men start messing with the Bible, when they start messing with the teaching of God, then they always have, have trouble. And so man has a part in it. Man has a part in his salvation. Otherwise, Peter wouldn't have said in Acts 2 verse 40, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Well, there's no need to save yourself. I mean, the, they would have said to Peter, well, why should we save ourselves? The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to us all, and boom, we're saved. You know, so... Anyway, so that, that's what we're talking about. So in the scheme of redemption, in the scheme of salvation, in the plan of salvation that God has set forth, um, God's grace is his part of salvation. He's what, he is, his grace is what's extending it. And uh, that's why we find in 1 Peter 5 verse 10, the God of all grace who has called us unto eternal glory by, by Jesus Christ. This, this is what we're talking about. He's the God of all grace. There's the divine side. That's, that's the divine side. But notice in Romans 5 and verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Well, Jesus is part of God's grace to man. Are you with me? God's grace is not just this big blanket that covers everybody, but rather when we start to see different aspects of it, it's, it's being fine-tuned. Christ is part of God's grace. And another part of God's grace that brings salvation is the Word of God. Now listen, friends. In Acts 14 and verse, uh, verse 3, Acts 14 and verse 3, Listen to what the Bible says. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace. The word of his grace. Now, is the word part of God's grace? You see, God has a divine side. There's a, there's a divine side to God's grace, and that is, involves Christ, and involves the word. But man has a part in that too. But the word of God's grace is 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 crucial to salvation as well. In Acts 20, verse 4, 24. Acts 20, 24. Paul says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might, fi might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. So the gospel, the word, Christ, all have part in God's plan for grace. Now, friends, you see, it, it's now we're still looking at the divine side here. We're still looking at God's side. This is grace that's bringing salvation. This is what's involved in it. But there's a lot of things that people don't realize belongs in grace. Now, just as Christ is part of, of God's grace, and so is the Word, notice this. There's one more thing about God's grace that we all should pay attention to, and everybody seems to draw a blank, you know, just kind of the mind goes brain dead when they when they say that when they hear this. In Ephesians three and verse one, listen listen to what is the a big piece of God's grace that men overlook or don't want to see. In Ephesians three and verse one, read with me. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and the same body and partakers of his promise by Christ, in Christ by the gospel. Now remember we've already talked about Christ being part of God's grace and the gospel being part of God's grace. So keep that in mind. Now verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me. 
by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So, there's some preaching involved, preaching of the words involved in, in spreading this grace or getting this grace to men. Now let's continue reading. Verse 9. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Now, did you hear, did you catch that? Paul said that the intent of God's purpose was made known by the church. God's grace includes the church. Now, why is it when people say saved by grace, saved by grace, saved by grace, they don't seem to want to put the church in there. As a matter of fact, if you, if you talk about the church, well, the church is not important. Well, if the church is not important, then God's grace is not important because God's grace is, is what reveals the church. You see this? So the church is a vital part of God's grace. And that's why when you read, for by grace are you saved through faith, you need to realize that means you're saved by Christ who is part of God's grace, who came because of God's grace. It's through the word that tells of God's grace and that uh, gives you instructions about God's grace. You wouldn't even know about God's grace if it wasn't the word. And then there's the church. See? God's grace is revealed by the church or in the church. And so it was all part of God's plan. God's plan of grace that saves men was, is wrapped up, uh, tied up and tangled up all in the church. Now, that's important, friends. That's important. Now, you might say, well, James, how is, how is the church part of, of God's grace? Well, we're going to discuss this. But I want you to see that it's not by grace only, all right? It's not by grace only. All right, let's, let's stop here. Let's give our phone numbers again, 336-427-9696. That's 427-9696, 427-WMYN, or 627-9596. 9563627 uh, WLOE. And if you want to build a program, we're talking about grace, and we're talking about not by grace only, saved not by grace only, but uh, there's other aspects of grace. There's other, other things involved in God's grace. Grace is, is God's part, but man has a part in his salvation that is. Uh, uh, from his end, God is grace is God's hand reaching down, and and faith and works is, is man's hand reaching up. Now listen to what the Methodist discipline says. The Methodist discipline says this. This is under the heading of the justification of man. It says we are were, we are counted righteous before God only for the merit of our Lord Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by faith and not of our own works or deservings. Wherefore we are justified by faith only is a wholesome doctrine and full of comfort, very full of comfort. So justified by faith only is a wholesome doctrine that the Methodist Church, Methodist Church will teach and that's full of comfort. Well, friends, if you're saved by faith only, that doesn't leave any room for God's grace. Anytime you say only, that limits everything else. Are you with me? Okay, let's, let's read on. Now again, this is from the Hiscox. Standard Baptist Manual. It says, uh, Justification includes the pardon of sin and the promise of eternal life of, uh, on principles of righteousness that is bestowed not in consideration of any works of righteousness which we have done, but solely, S-O-L-E-L-Y, solely or only through Faith in the Redeemer's blood. Now, do we see a problem here? One, one man-made creed book said, say, uh, holy by grace, completely by grace. And then others say, holy by faith, or only by faith, solely by faith. Well, friends, you just can't have both of them. You can't have saved by two things, grace and faith, and they both be only. 
It's just, it's just impossible. And the reason why um, people believe that's because they don't understand. They just don't understand the relationship between faith and grace. Now, listen to this. Listen to this. I want you to listen to uh, uh, a preacher. This is a Baptist preacher, Jerry Carter. And listen to what he says about uh, Ephesians 2 and verse 5. I'm going to try to pull it up here. Ephesians 2 and verse 5. He's going to say, he's going to tell us that it's a gift and there's nothing we can do for it. Now, we're going to, we're going to listen to this and we're going to comment on it later. All right. Let me stop it here for a minute. Make sure we got some. Make sure we got some volume going here. All right, we're gonna do a little click right here. Okay. Now here we go. Let's start all over again. This is Dr. Jerry Carter from Regional Baptist Church. Um, well, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number two, verse eight nine, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And like I said, please don't under misunderstand me. I'm not making light of baptism because baptism is very important. But salvation is a gift of God. Now, if a gift of God, if it's a gift, then it's freely given to us without us having to do anything for it. Then adding baptism to salvation is adding works to salvation. All right, so if it's a gift, we don't do anything for it. That's what he said. Now, friends, is that really how a gift works? I mean, can, is a gift not free? If we have to meet some conditions of that gift, I mean, if we have to meet the, the, the qualifications of that gift, does that mean it's not a gift anymore? I get this stuff in the mail all the time. You, you, you get this big card in the mail, and it's got a key stuck to it. Some auto dealership sending you something in the mail, and then it says, you know, here's your here's your car. You know, free car. Come, uh, come get your free car. And here's the key. If your key starts, you get the car. Well, guess what? I have to go. I would have to take the key. I'd have to put it in the slot, you know, the ignition switch, and turn it. Now, if that key started that car, would that mean that it's not free because I had to go and I had to insert the key and I had to turn the switch? Does that make it not free? You see what I'm saying? Just because there's conditions doesn't mean that it eliminates the gift aspect. Faith is man's part. Now, if, if salvation was by faith only, see, that eliminates grace and that eliminates blood. And the Bible clearly says in Romans uh, 5, Romans 5 and verse 9, that we are uh, justified by his blood. We shall be saved uh, from wrath through him. So if it's by faith only, then you take away the blood. You take away a confession. You take away the, the idea that you have to confess Christ. Now, I know that there's no one out there who believes faith only is going to then say, well, let's get rid of, of confession. Friends, when you say only, you eliminate everything. So this is what you have to understand. Grace is God reaching toward man and works of faith to meet the qualifications or the conditions that is set forth by God to obtain salvation is man's part. It doesn't change salvation. It doesn't mean that you're adding works to salvation, as, as uh, uh, Jerry Carter said but rather it is simply obedience to what God said. Notice this, in Acts 17 and verse 30, Acts 17 and verse 30, when Paul was preaching, telling people what God said, he said, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now friends, if God commands men to repent, that means that's something they have to do. So if God's grace is what appears to men, does that eliminate Repentance? Well, no. You say, James, you you kind of going off the deep end there. You you kind of goofy if you think that that a person can uh, be saved by grace only, but not repent. Well, friends, it's not by grace only. If you have to repent, you've got grace plus repentance. And I know you're going to say grace plus faith. See what we're talking about? Man has something to do. Man has to repent. Man has to believe. Man has to confess. These are things that are that are coupled with his faith. And so in faith, man is coming toward God 
and coming toward the salvation that God's grace has made available. God's grace has, brought, has uh, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And so man is coming toward God in faith, and God is coming toward man with grace. And so it's like it's like we're going to meet somewhere. Now, let's just use that illustration. What if I told you, and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll tell you right now, if you, if you can show me the Baptist church or the Methodist church in the Bible, if you can show me saved by faith only, in the Bible. I will meet you with a thousand dollars. I see what we did? I said, look, I've got the money. I've got a thousand dollars. I'll meet you at, at um, I'll meet you at Walmart in, in Mayadan. Or I'll meet you at Walmart and Reedsville. I'll meet you wherever. Now, if that's the case, if I'm if I'm gonna give you a free gift and I said I'll meet you somewhere, does that change the gift? If you have to come to me, if you come part way to me and, our, and I'm coming part way to you, does that change the gift? No. But this is what we're dealing with, friends. Not understanding that man has a part in his salvation just as God had a part in his salvation. It's like the, it's like the man that sent his son off to college. And he said, son, I want you to go to college. And the son said, no, I don't want to go. And the, and the, and the father said, well, you know what? I've put $10,000 in the bank for you. Oh, that perked him up. I've got ten thousand dollars made for you. Here's the condition: the checks have to be made out to the university or to the school. So, was was it still a gift? Yes. Was it to the benefit of the son? Yes. Was it was it a gift from the father? Yes. But could the son have access to it? Yes. If he went to college, if he went to school, if he met the conditions set forth by his father. See, see what we're talking about? So man has a part in his salvation, and so, do, so does God. So God's grace involves Christ, it involves his word, it involves the gospel, it involves the church. And man has to believe, he has to repent, he must confess Christ before man and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's man's... Uh, uh, part of coming back and meeting God and obtaining the salvation uh, that God has made uh, made available. Now, where is that salvation? That's that's the key. That's the key. But see, friends, when you're under, when you're saying saved by grace, you need to understand it's not an unconditional gift. And just because something is is unconditional, or excuse me, excuse me just because something is conditional. Just because there are some conditions on a gift does not uh, does not make it um, a free gift. I mean, it's still a free gift just because there are some conditions put on it. And if God can, if God, listen, if if God sent His only Son to die for our sins, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, John three sixteen, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now listen. Why is it that we feel compelled to tell God, well, you do everything for us, and then we'll take your gift? Now, what now, what kind of ingrate is that? You and I are sinners. You and I need salvation. You and I need the free gift that God is giving, and we're going to have the audacity to say, well, if I do anything for it, if I have faith, or if I repent, that's a works. So I'm, I'm adding something to my salvation. So, God, you're going to have to do everything for me. Please. Please. If that was, if that was, if I was giving you a gift and you said, well, James, you just want to bring it on out here to me. I'm going to say, you don't want it. You just forget it. If you can't, if you can't come and meet me part way to get it, then you don't need it. You don't want it. It must not be valuable to you. It must not be worth anything to you. So this is what we're talking about. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift to God. That verse says nothing. Uh, there's nothing in that verse that states that salvation is an unconditional gift. There's nothing in that verse. Now, if you want to talk about grace being a gift and then doing something for it, 
Just go back to the Old Testament and look at this example. In, in uh, Joshua chapter 6, in Joshua, you find the children of Israel are told that they have been given Jericho. They've been given Jericho. But now in Joshua chapter 6, the Bible says Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the, and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. Oh, really? Looks to me like the city's still shut up tight as a drum. They got all the gates closed. Nobody's coming in. Nobody's going out. And here's the children of Israel on the outside. But yet God says, I've given it to you. But here's what you got to do. Here's what you have to do. You have to compass the city, all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thus shalt thou do in six days. So do six days. So six days they walked around at once. And the priest shall bear the, uh, before the ark seven trumpets of rams. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times. And the priest shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast of the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. Now, and they passed around the city. They went around it once, once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, they went around it seven times. They blew the horns, gave a great shout, and the wall fell down. But God said, I've given it to you. But they still had to do something to get it. They had to do something to show that their faith in God was real, was genuine. Because faith without works is dead. Now, my friends, why is it that we can't see that when it comes to our salvation? Why, why can't we see that God says, you know what, I'm giving you salvation. And here's what you do to get it. And we want to say, no. No, I'm not going to do that. I don't have to do that. That's works. That's works. I'm not going to be saved by works. I can't do anything. Well, friends, let me tell you, if if, if someone told you, you know, there's a million dollars on the table, just come get it. I guarantee you'd be there in a heartbeat. And you would say, it's free. It's just mine. James tells us in James 2, <clears throat> verse 22, he says, Seest thou how faith wrought with works and by works was faith made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. See, you're justified by how you respond to what God said. Now that's just the fact of the matter. That's just all there is to it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2 verse 9. What does this mean? What does this mean, not of works, lest any man should boast? Friend, there are different kinds of works. There are different kinds of works. And that doesn't mean that anything you do is a work, therefore you can't do it to be, to be saved. I mean, works, um, uh, works that a man can't boast about, there's plenty of those. In, in John 6, verse 28, Notice this, they said unto Jesus, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Now is that a work of righteousness? Is believing, is believing on Christ, is that a work of righteousness? Or that's just, we got to get rid of that. That's a work. You're adding work to salvation. No one's going to say that. But yet when we say something else, when we have something else in the Bible that's revealed that we must do in order to be saved, well, oh, that's work salvation. That's adding to it. You just heard Jerry Carter say it. Oh, that's adding, adding baptism. It's adding works. Well, faith is a work. Jesus said you have to do this to work the work of God is to believe on him you've sent. So if all of you out there that are saying faith only, you're saying, well, I'm saved by, uh, you're saved by works. Titus 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of your regeneration and renewing the Holy Ghost. Friends, when Paul said not by works of righteousness, which we have done, that is, that's not by works of righteousness that we have determined. Works of our own righteousness. Uh, Romans chapter 10, 
Romans chapter 10, excuse me. Romans 10, Paul said that his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He said, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Well, when Paul says in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, those are works of righteousness that we determine are what's going to make us righteous. So if you devise a plan that says this is how I'm going to become righteous, then, then, yeah, you're not going to be saved by works. Those are the kind of works we're talking about. But salvation does come through some works, and that is the works that God commands to do. Not ones that we've come up with our own. Now, I'd like to hear your comments. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Again, the phone lines are open, 336-427-9696, 427-9696, or 627-9563, 627-9563. Now, again, somebody said, well, baptism is a work. Friends, I want you to consider this. Colossians 2 and verse 11. There's a word in these, in these verses that I don't think people pay, pay attention to. But Colossians 2.11, listen to what Paul says. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. I notice verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Through faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. That word operation is translated everywhere else. Is translated work or working. Work or working. Ephesians one nineteen, according to the working of his mighty power. Power, same word. Ephesians three verse seven, whereof I was made a minister according to the grace gift of the grace of God according given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Ephesians 4.16, the effectual working in the measure of every part. You see what we're doing here? We're talking about the work, the operation of God, the working of God, the working of God, the working of God. Philippians 3.21, according to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things to himself. Colossians 1, uh, 1.29, uh, striving according to his working, which he worketh in me mightily. Then Colossians 2.12, risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Titus uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, nine, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs of wonders. Now here's one place where it's, it's not working or operation. It is God shall send them a strong delusion. Now, if you want to talk about works, you want to talk about works in baptism, God is the one who do, who's doing the work. God's the one who's doing the work, the work there. So why, why do you want to foo-foo on baptism? Why do you want to foo-foo on that? God's the one who's working. You say, well, if you had baptism, that's work. Well, God's doing the work. And it seems to me like most people, when it comes to religion, they won't, they want a the lazy man's religion. They want God to do everything for them. They say, well, he's born a sinner, didn't do anything to become a sinner. Then the Holy Spirit, God has to operate on us so we can understand his word. God has to do that for us. Then God's going to save us. He's going to give us faith and repentance so that we can be saved. And then we're not going to be lost. Nothing we can do to be lost. So now we're going to be in heaven. Well, God could have cut out the middle man. He could have just not created us. I mean, what's the point? Why put us here on earth? To see if we'll obey him. Why give us a free will to see if we'll obey him? I mean, he could have just said, boom, let's just get let's go straight to heaven, you know? You know, let's go straight to heaven. Go on past go, collect $200 and go on to heaven. But he didn't say that. You see, we have a part to play in our salvation. But God is the one doing the working. And we have some responsibility. We have some obligation. In our salvation as well. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So salvation is a gift of God's grace. No doubt about it. But it's up to us to meet those conditions. So that God's grace can reach us. Now you say well James. 
<coughs> Excuse me. He said, James, a little bit ago, you talked about the you you talked about the church being a part of God's grace. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Let's go back to that verse. Let's go back to Ephesians. And let's just listen to what uh what Paul said again, Ephesians 3 and verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. And what that grace reveals is the church as part of God's plan for man's salvation. Now, how do I know that? Well, I know that because in Acts chapter 2, in verse 47, after people were told, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, the Bible says that they, they gladly received his word and were baptized, Acts 2 verse 41, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then verse 47, Acts 2 verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. God added the saved to the church. Now, if the church didn't have part of man's salvation, why did God put the saved in the church? See that? The church is part of God's grace. It's part of God's uh, grace that brings salvation. It, it's, it's a part of, God, of, the, of man's salvation. That's the church. Now, if the church is so important, why do so many people say it's not important? God thought it was important enough to talk about it. But I want you to listen. This is how men view the church. This is how men look at the church. They think that denominations are all part, or all exist because of God's grace. Now, I don't know which to believe. Because on one hand, I thought they were saying that the church, yes. I, on one hand, I thought that the church was not essential to salvation. And then on the other hand, they're going to start saying that, well, all these different denominations are part of God's grace. Listen, this is a, uh, I can't remember his first name, so-called Pastor Harris from Danville. Listen to what he says. And then, Brother Jordan, I asked God a question. Um, I said, Lord, why do you allow so many different churches? Danville the city of churches, so... Churches originate from breaks and all of this stuff. God took me to the scripture where it said, God would have it that no man should perish. Mm -hmm. The only way you could possibly do that is allow, through his um, loving grace, mm -hmm. to be denominations, to be other churches. Because if you don't get it here, hopefully you can get it there. All right. If you don't get it there, hopefully you can get it somewhere. <laughs> God would have it that no man should perish. Mm -hmm. The only way you could possibly do that, the only way you could possibly do that, the only way you could possibly do that is allow, through his um, loving grace, to be denominations. Now, friends, that, that's just blasphemous. I mean, that's, that's, that's just blasphemous. For a man to say the only way, only possible way, for a man to be saved and not, be per and not perish is for God. God to allow all these denominations so that in case you don't get it somewhere, you can get it somewhere else. Can't get it here, you get it there. That's the only way? If that's the only way possible, why did God, when he's talking about grace, why did the word of his grace not talk about any of these denominations? See, if, it was the, if the only way possible was for you and I to be saved, by having all these different churches out here that preach all these different things, contrary doctrines. We've already pointed that out. You got the Baptist saying saved by faith only. And then you got and you got the um the, the Methodist saying saved by grace only. Well which is it? Which one is it? Holy by faith, holy by grace, solely by faith. Which is it? And yet we're supposed to say, well, you're going to find God's grace in all these churches that God never talked anything about. Now, I know the Lord's church is part of God's grace because it's the body of Christ. We already pointed out Jesus is part of God's plan for man's grace or man's salvation.
God's grace has shown Christ, shown the Word. God's grace has revealed to us God's will, and that includes the church, which is the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22, and 23. So, if the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, and the grace of God includes the church, which is the body of Christ, where salvation is, where are all these different denominations in God's word of grace? And this is, this is what we're saying, friend. It's a, it's a misunderstanding about God's grace. People think, well, God's grace is just going to save, save everybody. All I got to do is say, believe Jesus, and, 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 and boom, I'm saved because God's grace is so good. You know what? There's, a, there's such a thing as abusing God's grace. There's a, such a thing as, as, as abusing God's grace. I mean, Paul said in, in Romans chapter 6, he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And friends, it, it's, it's really a, um, what, a slap at God to say, well, God, your grace, your grace has to provide all these different denominations because we just can't get along. We can't understand the word of your grace. We don't agree on the word of your grace, so we're going to have to change it so that we can all be sure that we're saved. No, friends. God has done his part. Why is it men can't do their part? Why is it that men can't be satisfied to say, you know what? The, the grace of God has, has been handed down. It's shown us the way of salvation. It's shown us how, uh, what we must do to be saved. And now we're going to obey it. We're going to comply. We're going to meet. We're going to meet God and receive that salvation. God done his part. <clears throat> I, I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I had... I, was living up here in Virginia, and I went home one uh, one time. We drove back to Texas, and my and my cousin uh, that lived about twenty miles away, uh, he gave me a call right as I was leaving, and he said, "Why didn't you come see me?" And I said, "Man, I just drove over a thousand miles. Why didn't you come see me?" You see, God sent His Son all the way from heaven, all the way down here, went through all the things He went through. Died on the cross, suffered, bled, died, rose again the third day, was abused, mocked, everything, all for us. And here you're going, well, God just come a little bit further. No, friends, take advantage of God's grace. It's being extended. It's in Christ. It's in the body of Christ. It's in the church. And if we can help you, we want to do that. If you call me, 276-340-2653, or you can come assemble with us at 250 Boulevard in the Church of Christ, we'll be glad to see you. We'll be, we'll be glad to talk to you, study the Bible with you. I mean, the word of God's grace is what we need to, to, to search out. I mean, if you're having trouble understanding what must I do to be saved, it's clear. It's clear in the Bible. But sometimes we need some help. In Acts chapter 8, there was a man that was reading from the prophet. He didn't know what, he didn't know what to do. He said, how can I understand? He said, someone teach me. Well, if you want someone to teach you, sit down with you and show you how the Bible does not contradict itself. In other words, when you understand <clears throat> what God's grace, how God's grace has been extended towards you, friends, you'll see it clearly. You'll see how, just how great and how wonderful God's grace really is to bring salvation to you. The Bible says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism puts you in Christ where salvation is. You can take advantage of all the grace that God has extended towards you, all the love and all the blessings that you find in Christ. Friends, I'm, I'm running up against the clock, uh, and I hope that you will uh, come visit with us, again, 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina, or you can reach me at Word from the Lord at gmail.com, 276-340-2653. Thanks for listening. Until next time, friends, make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. God bless, and have a good night.